welcome to Autocar. This is the latest version of Volkswagen's Golf. I'm gonna tell you a few things about the range and then we'll go for a drive. When the Mark 8 Volkswagen Golf arrived, some of its interior functionality let the side down, but this midlife refresh, let's call it Golf 8.5, sets things straight. The Golf is a conventional family hatchback at 4.3 metres long with an engine in the front. All but the base model have independent rear suspension. And there is a huge range of engines, including some plug-in hybrids with a long electric range. In total, there are eight engine and gearbox combos and five trim levels, plus hatchback or estate body styles. This one is a five-door hatch with a 148 horsepower, 1.5 litre petrol engine mated to a seven-speed auto with some mild hybrid assistance. It'll return 52 to the gallon and emits 122 grams per kilometre of CO2. The Golf range starts at under £27,000 but this R-Line is a whisk over thirty grand. So welcome to the inside of uh, the latest Golf 8.5. This one is a 1.5 TSI mild hybrid with a DSG automatic gearbox. It's in an R-Line trim. Fairly sort of middling variant. We kind of think this is where the sweet spot of the range might be. You can have this engine without the mild hybrid and with a manual transmission if you want to. But as is quite often the way these days with uh, internally combusted engines, because they have to worry about emissions, the response with the manual is not always perfect because the car is always monitoring what, what, what emissions it's putting out. It's always monitoring how much fuel it's putting in and it's matched to a DSG, this automatic gearbox feels like it's tuned for it and because it's got a 48 volt motor to assist as well when you come back on the throttle where the manual car without hybrid assist you might take a moment to wake up and think okay I've got to be very carefully introducing fuel into this this engine's got to do the same but it's also got an electric motor which can do well I can fill the torque for you while the turbo's spinning and while you're thinking about what to do with the fueling I'll just pitch in so response is very good it shifts very smoothly very cleanly Actually, I'll come on to the interior in a minute. Let's carry on talking about the drivetrain because I've started. It shifts very cruise, uh, smoothly and cleanly. If there is a problem, it is that. Brake pedal feel is not great. Like, really not great. This engine goes into a coasting mode where it disengages completely from the transmission and just sits at idle uh, if you lift off sometimes. And the reason for that is it's coasting on the screen so you can see it do it. The reason for that is because it's not using much fuel. You might remember, especially if you're in the UK, your driving instructor would have said, don't coast, never knock the car into neutral and just drive along with nothing happening because that reduces the amount of stability the car has and it does get that feel. And then when you start braking, you get a certain amount of response in the brake pedal, but then the engine will re-engage with the transmission and that adjusts the amount of braking you've got for the same brake pedal pressure. So the brake pedal is very spongy, very inconsistent, actually not very pleasant. And I think a car like the Toyota Corolla, which has had a longer established hybrid system, does it better. But this is quite a nice engine, it wires itself up, and you can mitigate what it's doing by knocking it into sport mode. The only problem is if you do that, is if it, ha it hangs on to gears much longer. So I'm driving along at 56 miles an hour, and it's kind of holding forth for a long time, and I don't want it to do that. So the sweet spot, is to select gears via the flappy panels itself, but leave it in sport mode and then it won't do the whole coasting thing. You won't get quite such a good economy, but it improves brake pedal feel, it improves all round response, it, improves, it just makes this car nicer to drive. Anyway, that out of the way, let's talk about the interior. Sometimes in a review, I would run you through all of this stuff while stationary, but you know what? You've got to use these things on the move, haven't you? And the previous Golf was criticised. This time around, every single version gets physical buttons on the steering. Well, it wasn't the case necessarily with the last one. Some models did, but some models didn't. Mirrors, the fog light switch, the rear demist, and the maximum uh, screen cleaner on the front, the maximum air aircon on the front. They're all separate buttons one push away that's good so this stuff like the fog light is safety critical stuff and I absolutely think it should be one push of one separate individual button the fog light is it's fine with me it is good with me um, and then there's the big central touchscreen which has been improved 
I'm not 100% sure it is better still than a rotary dial, but it's pretty close. I mean, it, you know, it's re it's, it is now fine. It is now good. Driving assistance systems are available. I mean, there is a separate button down here to, to reach through to them, or there's one button at the top of the screen. And then the ones it gets wrong, like the speed warning, because it reads road signs, but it reads quite a lot of them not correctly. Lane assist doesn't work very well in the UK. They're quite quick to switch on or off. And otherwise, it's got a big, clear screen, and it talks to your phone quite well as well. What Volkswagen calls the MIB4 multimedia system is significantly improved here. The screen's bigger at 12.9 inches and the main climate controls and heated seat controls are permanently displayed on it. It's also much quicker to respond. And while the touch bar for the temperature and volume control remain, that now lights up and is easier to swipe. All versions have proper buttons on the steering wheel. In terms of interior fit and finish, Volkswagen very rarely has anything to worry about in this class and it is still the same here. Soft touch materials on the top surfaces, a couple of harder materials on the bottom surfaces, but they all look really good. Material quality choice is good, appearance is good, everything fits tightly together. The driving position has never been a bother either, low or high, back or close, big widely adjustable steering wheel. It is a very pleasant, very good, very ergonomically sound driving environment, always has been. And in terms of the ride and handling, you got options. So this car has got adaptive dampers, which are an option and our road testers think are worth having. You can put them in a default mode if you want to. They go in comfort or to sport. Or if you go to the individual mode and then you can select. I can't count them all, but I'm not going, there's too many. Comfort is the fourth one up. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and then sport, and then three more before you get to the firmest damper setting. I think that's quite a lot. I'm not sure it needs quite that many. There is a good setup in here somewhere, but you have to search to find it a bit. I think if you can get the drivetrain out of that mode where it coasts and gives the brake pedal its unpleasant feel, and you get the dampers into a middling mode where they do quite good work, this is one of the best cars in the class to drive. It's refined, it's smooth, but also Autocar's an enthusiast publication. It's also quite engaging and good fun to drive at the same time. Ultimately, the Golf, when it arrived in Mark 8 form, didn't necessarily sit at the top of the class owing to some issues with, most notably, the infotainment system. Those issues now mostly fixed, the rest of the package is as impressive and enjoyable as it ever was. If you are looking to see which car sits at the top of the Golf class, it may actually just be a Golf.